come on now. Come on, that's enough of that jazz. Crying out loud. Time is running short. We're all getting closer to the end. We got to get on here. Going. Hey, why do we carry on this myth about it being cold out? What is with this New York idiocy about cold, cold, schmold? Uh, going. Why? I'll, I'll sing you some cold weather ballads, Dad, here tonight. No, seriously, this is this is not even cold at all. Not not even remotely cold. And yet the poor old New York sits here. This is this is the city of dynamic self pity. How's that for a song lyric? Oh, this is the city of dynamic self pity. The city that weeps in its beard. Yeah, this this is a this city really. Uh, uh, I can tell you this that I I talked to my mother in Chicago last week. <laughs> And at the time I was on the phone with her, she said, uh, wait a minute. I said, how, how is it, Ma? How is the weather? And she says, oh, all right. And I said, well, how is it? She says, oh, well, wait a minute. I'll look out. And so I could hear her cracking the ice as she's looking out between the geraniums, you know, in the kitchen to look at the thermometer that she's got strapped on the windowsill there, you know, with the cupboard with ice flows. And I could hear her talking. And then she comes back to the phone. She says, it's about 12 below. I said, below zero. She said, what do you think? You know, that's just the way it is, you know. And here in New York, they're so oh, cold. And the guy on the radio is saying the temperature is now 25 degrees. It's a cold, terrible day, so don't go out, folks. 25 degrees. And this nutty city is the only city in the country yet that's hipped on skiing. What do you think you do? Where, where do you ski, you nuts? Crying out loud, you know, this is a masochistic city if I ever saw one. On the one hand, they're all screaming, yelling, trying to get in and out of cabs, with hitting each other, trying to get into a heated cab. And those same louts are going up into Vermont, where it's 107 below zero, and busting their ankles. You know, I suppose the next thing you know, guys are going to work out some system where you can use a cab to ski in. You know, go down the side there with a... <laughs> yeah, this is really a nutty time. I'll, uh, I, I don't I don't like to... You know, it's funny, as, as an old, as an old uh, frostbitten Midwesterner, this... This weather just gets my blood going good. It really does. It, that a guy, that a guy who comes out of the wilds of northern Indiana and the whistling prairies of Illinois, it is only at about this time that his radiator begins to really move. Actually, you know, we have no truly. You know that there are certain metals, elements uh, that uh, that have different melting points. Of course, you know that that mercury under ordinary circumstances is actually melted. You know that's a, that it is ordinarily a solid. But during, yes, it is a solid. And, and during its, uh, its regular room temperature life, it is melted because it's too hot. Well, this is literally the case with a good Midwesterner, that a Midwesterner does not begin to actually think good until the temperature is around 15 below. And, uh, yes, his overload relay begins to kick in and everything starts to work. He begins to hum and sing and work it out. And I, I, I can, uh, I don't know whether I should tell you any really genuine cold weather stories here. Uh, of uh, of that of that whistling prairie world out there, where re they really had cold. I'll I'll tell you one night. Now uh, I don't want to. Uh, this is not in the way of nostalgia because it's still cold out there. Of course, you you probably heard in the news that they, and nobody even thinks about it out there. They were they have news items about it here, but out there it's just the weather report that there was 30 inches of snow, for example, in the last five hours in a town in Wisconsin. 30 inches. Well, I couldn't believe it. This afternoon, I'm hearing Bruce Elliott on, you know, and there's a little piddling little snow coming down, a little flakes, you know, it's a little, little brisk, in the, and he's announcing all the places that are closed. They're all closing up over in Jersey, and all the meetings that were scheduled for tonight, they're not going to hold them. Well, I suspect something right away, that those people that are, that are not going, and all those meetings that are closing up, are chickening out and didn't want to be held in the first place. They were looking for the quickest out they could get. You know? <laughs> And, and uh, it's a fascinating thing. This is, this is the land of the great cop-out. And uh, the first flake of snow and the entire school system of Long Island quits and goes home. And watches television, which is what it always wanted to do anyway. Why don't you admit it? You're not interested in education out there in Long Island, for crying out loud. You're interested in swinging. Making martinis and all that stuff. I, I know. I know all about Long Island. <laughs> Staten Island, oh, it's even worse. Terrible, terrible. Well, let me tell you, though, about one night. I remember vividly one particular night. There, there's a, see, there's a thing that, that Midwestern winters do that, that does not really happen here in the East because we have an ocean here. 
And this ocean is a great tempering body. By that I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it acts like a big heater out there during the winter time, and it acts like a big cooler in the summertime. Well, there's no such thing, really. The, the, the lake is the opposite in, in the Midwest. That the lake uh, acts like a... Oh, boy, it, it makes it even colder because the lake, and I'm talking about Lake Michigan here, is, is an enormous flu. It really is. It brings the wind unbroken directly down from the Arctic Circle, which sweeps down over, over uh, Michigan, and it whistles right down that lake, and it screams through the Straits of Mackinac, the Straits of Mackinac, and whistles past... Ludington and Benton Harbor, and it gains steam until finally as it approaches the southern end of the lake, that wind is howling 150 miles an hour, and boom, it hits the shoreline there, sweeps over Hammond, Gary, and Chicago, and bathes it in what's left over from the Arctic Circle, and you can smell the polar bears. <sighs> oh, boy, and, and it goes down, uh, they, of course, because of the way it is there. Uh, there is something happens that does not happen here. It is not at all uncommon for the temperature to drop 30 degrees in maybe a half an hour. I mean 30 degrees. Boom, boom, pow, thump. It goes down. I mean, you go out of the house, it's 40 degrees. You walk down, you get in your car, and you start to start your car. You know, it's fine. The sun is shining. Ah, 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 ah. The car is going. And all of a sudden, you see the, the, the windshield is clouding over just while you're sitting there. And between grinds of your starter, it is now dropped down to 20. And just as you reach for the third one, it's down to 7 above. And the fourth shot of your starter, it's frozen. It's 10 below. You get out. Oh. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, of course, not much more than just maybe five degrees, but it really is a fantastic thing. I, I, I'll, I'll remember this. Now, here's one night. I'm going to give you... What, what, it ha what happens is this, you see, is, uh, is because of the precipitous drop and the precipitous fluctuation of weather out there, nobody any, anymore in Chicago, nobody even talks about the weather. It's just there. Now, a guy who has lived next to the Grand Canyon for 500 years does not exclaim every morning at what a big hole in the ground is out there. You know, he just walks around and the world is composed of holes in the ground as far as he's concerned. And I can tell you, Arabs are never amazed at how much sand there is in the desert. You know, that's just there. They are never talking about the heat. It is always there. It has, it has always been there. And they don't even know it. And so the temperature may be 130 degrees and that Sirocco is whistling along and the wind is flying and an Arab is just standing around picking his teeth. You know, he's just, you know, what? it's just an ordinary Wednesday as far as he's concerned. <laughs> and all the rest of us, it's, oh, what is it? The wind is blowing and her eyeballs are scorched. Not an Arab. Well, and so it is with the residents of northern Indiana, which get they, they get the full blast of that wind howling down the lake and, and around Chicago. This is why they call it the Windy City, you know. The lake and its juxtaposition with the prairies produces a turbulence. I don't want to go into the meteorological problems here. That means a lot of wind, Dad. <laughs> and it howls and whistles in and out of the Randolph Street Station like something, like a banshee gone out of its skull. Well, on, on, on good cold winter nights, which generally do not occur in the Midwest until after the first of the year, they're just warming up now. They're just getting set for the winter. Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, because the lake, you see, because the lake is a lot of water, it does keep it a little warm out there for a while in the fall. But then when the lake cools off, it cools off with a vengeance like the freezing compartment of a hot point refrigerator. It really cools off, Dad. You can see ice in that lake. Well, walking along by the mill, for example, I, when I worked in the steel mill, which was built right on the lake, you know, the steel mills are sticking out in the lake. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, all steel mills are sticking out into the lake because they use the lake for ore shipments, the boats that come down from, from uh, the Masabi Iron Range and from way up north that bring in the coal and all so forth, and of course ship out the stuff too after they make it. Uh, it is necessary to have water for a steel mill. Well... In, in January and February, the ice flows on Lake Michigan extend as far as your eye can see. They go maybe eight or nine miles. You know, there's a big ice breakup. The lake is totally frozen over during the winter. Not frozen over, but it is impassable for shipping. Are you aware of that? 
that they have the big spring breakup? Well, I have seen ice flows in Lake Michigan in April. Ice flows that were, <laughs> were like nine stories high and about 17 miles across. Well, that means you've got a pretty brisk April when the wind is blowing off an ice flow that extends all the way up to Sault Ste. Marie and blows it right down your ear, <laughs> right into the, into, the, into the windows in the bedroom. You've got a pretty cold April, I'll tell you. Uh, and, of course, likewise, uh, in the middle of January and February, it's fantastic. Well, I'll tell you one night. I remember this night because it was so vivid. You know, the, the, the really big nights make it with a kid. Uh, and I was, uh, well, I can tell you exactly. I was in uh, sixth grade. I was in sixth grade, exactly. How old was a kid in sixth grade? Because I can tell you who it was. It was Miss Smith. He's, what, ten? Ten. Okay, well, all right, I'm ten years old, see, and I'm in sixth grade. And I, and I come home from school. My kid brother comes home from school, and we went to different schools then. And, and he went down to the, the school that's about four blocks away, and I went to the one that was about a mile and a half away, you see. This is in Indiana. And so it is now about 6 o'clock. The temperature is roughly 30 or so, which is a very warm day in the middle of winter in Chicago, in that area. And everybody's out, you know, and throwing little snowballs around. Because they always have snow. That's another thing. Snow lands on the ground in the Midwest. I'd say roughly about uh, October, let's say, they get their first snowfall. The, the original snowflakes are still there in June. The original ones. They just move them around, that's right. They move them off to one side a little bit, but they're still there. I've seen streets, main streets, covered with snow and, and successive short freezes and, and uh, thaws and snow and thaw and snow to where the street is two or three feet higher than it is normally. And, and it is a paved street, paved with ice. They can't get it off. Literally cannot remove it. And so people just drive on the ice. They, the, the street then is coated with a coating of ashes and stuff. And you think that's the street. Well, well finally, when, when springtime comes, the, the whole street sinks two and a half feet. It just goes right down. You find shoes. You find old footballs. You find a couple of lost natives. And, yeah, they'll find a native that's been lost ever since September. They'll find him in a drift. You know, that's the end of it, you know, when it thaws. Well, uh, speaking of lost, this is WOR, AM with FM, New York here. But uh, I don't know. I suppose I'm, I'm boring the daylights out of you because nothing is worse than rotten weather stories. But I'm going to tell you what happened on this night. And I'm not exaggerating. It, it, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. It was about 30 degrees, and it gets immediately dark out there. Uh, at, at this time of the year, there is hardly any, any, uh, any twilight. Uh, it's either light or it's immediately dark. And most of the days in the Midwest, in the middle of winter, and because of the way it is, because of a lot of other things, the weather conditions out there, it's extremely dark. It is very gray a good part of the time. I can remember in schools when it's so dark that they have to have all the lights on, and it's just like night almost in the middle of the afternoon, in uh, in a good, really a cold winter day. It's gray, stygian gray. It's almost black. Well, you get home, it's about 30, 30, maybe 25, something like that, just a little bit below freezing. And it's about uh, 4 o'clock, about the time the kids come home, and it's already pretty dark, and the lights are on. So I go to the store. My mother says, go to the store. Well, I start out to go to the store, which was about a block and a half away. Now, remember, there was already snow, which had been on there, on the ground, off and on for maybe a month and a half. Just snow and, and rubble and ice and stuff. And so I'm running along, and I'm sliding, and it's uh, the snow and everything. And about halfway to Mattingly's store, I feel this... It just starts out like that. It, there's a big puff of absolutely blood-chilling, ice-cold wind that's like opening up an enormous deep freeze with a fan attached. Just, just one puff. Well, I took off from Mattingly's store knowing exactly what is about to occur. It has come from the direction of the lake, which was about a mile and a half away. I get in Mattingly's store, and I'm buying whatever the stuff is that says on the note, and they're loading it up, the hamburger and the, the, you know, the, the, the salami, and I'm getting, I'm getting the sauerkraut and the red cabbage and stuff and the oleo and everything, and I'm buying all the big stuff we're going to have, and I'm loading it up, and I got my bag, and I walk out of Mattingly's store, 
And it is now about 10 or 15 degrees colder than when I started out, and it is roughly about 50% darker. It gets dark almost instantly when the big coal comes down from the north woods. You see, the north woods we can practically see from the front porch. Uh, most people who live in New York have never seen the northern lights. Well, the northern lights are a very common sight in backyards in the Midwest. And, and already it's starting to come. Along with the wind, these tiny pellets of this hard Arctic snow. Now... The snow that I'm referring to is a different kind of snow than the kind of snow we get. These big, soft flakes that come flying down. These are like tiny ice BBs. They are, they're little BBs. They're like sand. It's very fine and very hard and gritty. And it, it blows your face and burns your face and scours you like you're, like you're being scoured by some kind of fantastic frozen sandpaper. Well, I am, I'm trudging home now against the wind. And the wind is picking up. The temperature is dropping maybe a degree or two every five minutes. It really does drop about every five minutes a degree or two, maybe three, maybe four. It goes down so fast. Well, shh. I'm about halfway home. My nose is running. My eyes are watering. My mitten is lost. My mitten is gone. You know, you get a frozen mitten and it's gone. And I'm crying and yelling and hollering. And the wind is howling. And I see about nine other kids all around. You know, Watts is struggling against the wind. And there's all the kids are coming home from the store, which was the big scene. You know, they go to the store. And you can see kids dotting the horizon. They're like, like lost camels in a fantastic desert. And the wind in the house looks like it's a million miles away. You can see a light, you know. Hey, whoo, and you're struggling, and the cars are going past. And every car that goes past, when it's really getting cold, you can tell, it leaves a trail of exhaust about maybe 30 or 40 feet behind it of condensation. That's really getting cold now. And I knew it was cold. Already now, it must have been about zero. In the, in the, in the half hour that I've been on the way to the store, it is now down to maybe zero. And going down like a rock, plummeting. You know, wind is picking up and the wind is howling maybe 45, 50 miles an hour. Not in gusts, but in a steady icicle stream. It's like it's, like it's made of a million ice picks. Oh, oh, woe is me. And the wires, we have these big wires above us, you know, the, the, the telephone wires are screaming. You see, all the wires here in New York are pretty well hidden, you know. Well, in towns in the Midwest, the wires are above ground, you know. They have these telephone poles, and you can hear those wires screaming like the rigging of a clipper ship. Believe me, heading into the Cameroons... The wires are whistling, and I finally get up on the front porch, and it is just insane. The, the house is already... The, the, immediately what happens is all the storm windows freeze up completely. You can't even see in the house. And those storm windows freeze up so hard and so fast that even the light does not show through the ice. The ice is just a thick white coat of a kind of snow. It's like the kind of stuff that you got inside the freezing compartment of your refrigerator. And then bang up! Oh, go! As open goes the door and I topple into the living room, a solid block of ice, my galoshes clanking and my ears falling off, yelling and hollering, and the oleo is frozen solid. And believe me, the meat is... Fr I had a hamburger and the meat is frozen. Have you ever carried home frozen hamburger, you know? It started out dripping in red and it's frozen. Well, I get in the house and I'm yelling, ah! and, and my mother immediately takes off my sheepskin which clanks and bangs, and I, and I was wearing my helmet, you know, the, the leatherette helmet with the sheepskin inside. Well, I, it's the first time I have ever seen my goggles. You know, I had these goggles, these, these celluloid goggles on the top. Well, the celluloid goggles were frozen over like windshields of cars. And there, I mean, you know, she drags me in, and there I'm standing there. <laughs> I don't know, I must have had about nine times, really, I must have, uh, now that I think back on it, because I hurt for about a week after it, I must have had at least five different places that were badly frostbitten, but in those days you were just cold. They didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't immediately call the pediatrician or anything like that. They just rushed you into the john and poured hot water on you or stood you by the radiator, that's all. <laughs> you know, I stand by the radiator while I'm dripping, you know, I'm beginning to melt... So I'm standing by the radiator, and boy, it is howling out there. The wind is booming in, 
And just about that time, the old man arrives home, screaming, yelling mad, with the with the Graham Page. He has been caught with half a load of zero, and and <laughs> and it caught him. It caught him in mid-flight, and the Graham Page arrives like a gigantic eight-wheel locomotive. There was more steam coming out of that clunker. Believe me, that you got out of a roundhouse on a big Saturday night. Shoo! The water is screaming in the old man's heart. Quick, get the hot water. Oh, for God's sakes, hurry up. They're going to crack the block. And he's yelling and in and out of the house. He's running. And, and you could hear, the, you could hear the, the Graham is out there. He's keeping the motor running, but it's in mortal agony. You know, it's, it's, it's a death throes. And the water is screaming, and the old man is running back and forth. And he tears out of the back of the house, and he's bound for Anderson's filling station to get some zero on, you know. <laughs> Yelling and hollering, and he falls down the steps on the ice and into a snow drift, and he's gone. And the old Graham Page is out there, and the wind is howling, and I'm standing by the radiator, yelling and screaming because my ears hurt. And my kid brother is hiding under the under the under the you know he's hiding under the kitchen table, watching and whimpering. Well, finally, it was wild. The snow started to come down. It then started the snow hell bent for election. Excuse the expression, but it started to come in. The world was a solid white out there. It was absolutely solid white. You could just see it slanting, and the wind, you know, carries it horizontally to the ground. And, 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 <laughs> it's going in the, we can hear the old Graham out, it's hitting on about three now, it's pumping the water out through its guts, through the back end, and it's, uh, you couldn't see anything, and my mother keeps running back and forth, pouring hot water into it, trying to save it. <laughs> and she's got on her sheepskin and yelling, hurry up, close the door when I go out, hurry up, ah! boom, and the door closes, she's carrying out a jug of water. Well, through the snow and the storm, you could see the old man approaching with five cans of zero on. He's going to save the car. <laughs> I mean, that's the first thing that these nuts out there think of, you know. So he comes plodding in through the driveway and up there, and he's pouring the zero in. Well, the car was already pretty sick, you know. He's pouring the zero, and every time he'd pour in the zero, and it would spit it out. He's pouring it. Wah, 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 shh. He's all right, for crying out, give me a blanket, quick, quick, a blanket. He's putting blankets on. I don't know why they put blankets on cars, but that was a, a big thing. To put a blanket, so the old, so the old man is running, and you ripping the blankets off the bed. You know, we're here with other people, the, the devil with the people. You know, he's going to save the Graham. So he's running out, putting blankets and comforters and everything on the on the hood. Well, in the meantime, the snow is starting to come down. It is really coming down. Well, my father realized immediately what was about to happen. He puts the car in gear. He didn't care whether she was knocking, roaring, steaming, and drives it into the into the get right straight into the garage. He just drives it in there. The steam is hissing out, and he turns it off, piles up the blankets on it, runs for the house, and the wind is really coming down. And before he goes, he slams the door as hard as he could on the garage, gets up into the house, and we sit in the kitchen. All of us are sitting. The old man is purple with rage. If there's anything that makes a Midwesterner mad, it's when his car freezes up. You see, because they all, like everybody else, push their luck. Ever since Thanksgiving, he figured he would go in and get, you know, well, all right, see. And all he had was a few drops left from last year. And the way the Graham, you see, the Graham used everything. This Graham page used gaskets the way most cars use oil. He was putting a gasket in every third day, you know. It's just the kind of car like that. It burnt everything. So, so he's sitting there, and of course, nobody can get madder than a guy who's mad at himself for lousing up. And he is really mad. He's sitting at the kitchen table madder than the devil, and every once in a while he gets up and he, he takes a penny. And this is a Midwestern trick. You take a penny, an ordinary penny, and you hold it on the window, the frozen window, and the penny will melt a tiny round spot. It'll make a clear peephole in a frozen up window so you can look out. So he's got these two penny holes for his eyes and he's looking out at the garage. He says, that damn thing! And he's looking out, whoo, the wind is drifting it up. And, and, and by now, it's been maybe a half an hour, my mother is serving the hamburgers, the garage is already drifted up to the eaves. It is that quick. This stuff is coming down in screaming, maniacal, bushel basket fulls from up in the north woods somewhere, and it is bringing large chunks of the lake in with it. And it is now up to the eaves in these great... Well, the garage looked like a pyramid. It just went up like that. No sides, you know? Just drifted up. 
and it continues and continues, and the wind is screaming and howling now, and the snow is coming down, and we are now looking out of the front window. I'm going to describe a sight that, 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 that is, is emblazoned in my mind. When you talk about great winter nights, about a block and a half from our house, there were street streetcar wires. You know, the, the streetcars went past there. They had an interurban electric. The North Shore, as a matter of fact, is what it was. And the South Shore, they had these big interurban trains that, that still run in Chicago. And uh, they're electric trains. Well, about a block from our house, these wires were becoming covered with this fantastic coating of frozen ice and snow. Have you ever seen pictures of ship rigging? Uh, when, when a ship has come in from the North Sea... Well, these wires were covered, and they were breaking. And every time one would break, there would be a tremendous explosion. It would just light up the whole sky like an enormous fireworks display. It would go, and this great arc. And the wire, of course, would fall down in the snow and would just explode when it hits the snow, because this is very, very high amperage voltage that is laying around there. And, of course, everything is stopped now. And, and these wires keep breaking, and about a half a mile from our home, uh, across the big prairie, was a series of high-tension wires that carried 30,000 volts over to the refineries. Well, now, these are the big towers, you know, the great big steel towers. You see them over in Jersey over there. Well, these towers, Dad, started to go down. They were going down in the combined rush of wind, ice, and snow that had hit. It was now about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Nobody's asleep. The wind is piling up that snow. And, and looking out of the front window of our house, we had a terrace. And we had a big front porch, and the, the steps went down. There were about seven or eight steps down to the lawn. And then the lawn went down, and then there was another six or seven steps down to the street level. It was one of those terrace things. Now our porch is just level with the street. That is covered, Dad, all the way to Stryker's house across on the other side. Stryker's house was right up to the windows on the first floor by now. And it is in great peak drifts, just reaching straight up and down like, a, like an enormous white sea. And that wind is screaming, and it is just it's laying horizontally. The, the, the snow is coming in great rolling gusts. Have you ever seen tumbleweeds? Well, one of the one of the surprising sights in a real snowstorm is what they call rolling snow. Rolling snow is, I suppose, the equivalent of rolling snow is spume in, in the ocean. Spume. Have you ever seen the, the the wind whip up the water so much that the water looks like it's smoke? It goes. It it it, it rolls over the ocean. Well, you see great rolling waves of snow, just literally rolling, just. And it's not really drift snow. This is the way the snow, it's, it's like snow that is coming down at an angle and then hitting the ground and then bouncing up and going on and on until it gathers a kind of puff of smoke. It's like waves of snow rolling along over the ground. Oh, boy, it's an insane sight when you get a, a 50 and a 60 mile an hour wind howling along. Well, at about that time, I would say it was about 9 o'clock. And the big, the big towers, we saw two big towers go down with a fantastic roar, gigantic explosion. And somewhere, someplace, they cut the electricity. They had to cut it all. And all the lights went out in the entire town, just like that. Boom! Dead silence. Except for that wind. And immediately, do you know that in the Midwest, everybody has... A, a drawer down in the in the in, in the cupboards in the kitchen, a drawer that's got all that stuff. And among all the stuff, among the string, they always have about nine emergency candles for exactly this. These white candles that they buy. So immediately, my mother is running for the candles. <sighs> the wind is screaming over that over that wild ground, just screaming. <sighs> And it is pitch black. You cannot see a light now, of course, for miles around. And then gradually be, you begin to see the candle, just a little tiny candle. And you see people peeking out of these little tiny, these tiny penny holes, you know, once in a while. And you see then, and this is probably the most spectacular sight, you see where guys have abandoned cars. And as far as you can see along the roads, and this is not, uh, this, this is not, uh, uh, this is not a, a, a wild country town. As far as you can see along the streets and the roads, you just see these little tiny hills 
that are barely discernible, just a little bump, and you know it is a car that somebody has abandoned. If he was lucky, there were at least a half dozen people caught in cars, by the way, who had to be rescued maybe two days later, actually stuck in, the, could not get out. They couldn't open the doors or anything. It was frozen. Their cars were frozen stiff. They said, we'll pull over to the side of the road, and by the time they pulled over to the side of the road and rested for ten minutes, the car was covered up. That's the kind of snowstorm it was. Well, by now, the, the ground is just like, it's level, and you can just see the roofs of houses as far as you can see, and it is now covering our porch and is right up to the windows and drifting down sort of gray rolling drifts. Our driveway, which was between our house and Bruner's house, which had been like a chasm, an actual chasm, you know, uh, between the two houses, and it was down below the level of the lawn. It was one of those down with the, with the little concrete abutment, you know, it was absolutely, it was disappeared completely. The, the snow in the driveway must have been ten feet deep, at least, in the driveway, because that was like, shoot, you know, it caught it all. Well, we're sitting there, and the wind is screaming in. And by that time, it's a, you know, we're getting ready to, it's a, kids are starting to cork off, from the, and, and once in a while you'd hear the dull thud of a telephone pole going down out there. Yeah, oh yeah, everything went off. As a matter of fact, the radio completely conked out. There were four or five antenna blown down. The big antenna, you know, WGN, a couple of others, just absolutely, that was it. They just went off the air. They were blown off the air. They lost their current, everything. It was a fantastic blizzard. Well, well, by, by, by about 10 or 11 o'clock, the temperature stood at roughly 25 below zero. It had dropped from about 25 or 30 degrees at uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon until now, just a few hours later, it had dropped about 50 degrees. That is a drop. And and with that wind and with that, that strange buckshot snow, you really had yourself a gas. Well, of course, we're trying to go to bed. Well, by that time, um, there is a new complication. I don't know whether you've ever lived in a house where all the pipes are frozen. Well... <laughs> That complicates a lot of things. We don't even have to go into that. The whole, everything was frozen in the house. And then the final kicker, the final irony, the wind was coming in and icing up so much that in some nutty way it was icing up everybody's chimneys. We had chimneys, you know, sticking up, and it was icing it up. It was doing something and blowing the wind was coming down into the furnaces. And so the old man suddenly gets panicky at about 10 o'clock because coming out of the hot air registers is great yellow puffs of coke smoke. <laughs> oh, 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 he's running down in the basement. Hey, oh, it's done. Hey, boom, 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 he's checking. He's hollering. What a, uh, he can't figure it out. What, his, his first reaction when the furnace did anything was to grab the big, the big handle on the side and shake it and start hitting it with the poker. That was his first reaction. Well, the more he shook it, the more the smoke is coming out, and we're up in the in the in the front room, you know, and the smoke is coming out and puffing around. You can't open the windows, and the old man is saying, "What am I going? Hey, hey, for crap! What? Will you work the damper? It's the damper. Get the damper." Well, we had a thing called the damper, <laughs> which was behind the kitchen door. It was a kind of a thing, you know. You'd move it. It was for it was it's a damper on it or something. You, you ever hear of such a thing? Well, we're working the damper. He figured it was the damper then. So so my mother's up there working the damper. And with that, a giant puff of smoke comes out of the chimney and out of the furnace and out of all hot air registers. And it's even worse. And the old man says, Will you quit fooling with the damper? Her crying out loud. Boom, boom. And the furnace goes, boop, makes a big belch, boop. And it kind of blows up. Have you ever seen a furnace blow up? It went, bloop. And the old man is screaming and yelling down in the basement. And the only thing he can figure to do is to put out the fire. Which is what he proceeded to do. He got about four buckets of water out of the basement clothes. <laughs> we had these big clothes things down there. And he gets about four. Push! That's it. Ooh. He says, I figure it's better to have the fire out and freeze than to get gassed. And there it is. The fire is out. Yellow smoke is hanging in the in the draperies. <laughs> it's hanging in the bedroom in the john. And next door, you can hear Mrs. Bruner yelling at Mr. Bruner. The same thing has happened. You can hear him yelling and hollering. And Mrs. Bruner then breaks a window and yells over to our house and hollers, Is your house warm? Can we come over? Their house is cold. Everybody's house is cold. It's about 30 below zero now. Well, all I can tell you is this. <laughs> 
<laughs> no electricity. The pipes are frozen. The, the furnace has conked out. You never saw more stuff piled on beds to try to keep warm. Everybody is huddled in the front bedroom with, a, with every coat, every, every piece of junk out of the closets. Guys are wearing tennis shoes on their ears. You know, the whole thing. Everybody is sitting there. Sitting, and, and, and they take the bed clothes off. They got everything piled up. It's like that. everybody's piled under a great big pile of stuff. It's like moles. And the wind is screaming and hollering out there all night long. And all I remember as a kid, finally falling asleep under 17, maybe 18 pounds of daybed stuff. You know, with big creton curtains and everything was piled up. The rug was on top of us. And finally, my mother, my mother had a great gambit. She would take all the papers, our, our newspapers, and put them inside. You know, you, you put them inside of your pajamas. You ever seen that trick? She would, she would line us with newspapers. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, sure, it works great. So we line up with newspapers. You put your bathrobe on. You put your football suit on. You put your baseball suit on. You put your pongee long johns on. You put your helmet on. You put everything on. You put your, 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 your sheepskin on. You put the whole scene. I had everything on. And then finally, I'm asleep there in the comforters. That's all I remember. Well, the next morning, there it is. The wind has stopped. And the sun is out as brilliantly as it's ever shown. In fact, this is what generally happens out there after a blizzard. That sun comes out. Well, of course, immediately the kids are out looking, looking out, at the, out at the world, you see. And it's about 5 o'clock in the morning. And I do not know how to describe to you the feeling of an Indiana house at 5 o'clock in the morning after the furnace has been out for eight or nine or ten hours, and the wind has been blowing down the eaves. The wind has been blowing in every possible crack and crevice. Even the mice were huddled around us, just hanging on to us to, for protection. It is so fantastic. And, 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 and immediately, the only thing that worked was the gas oven. And so my mother is out there with the gas oven going, and the entire family is standing around the oven, and we're just standing there with the heat going like mad. And, and what do you think we're doing? Well, I'll tell you what we're doing. There was not even the slightest thought of not going to school. <laughs> no. I mean, it's just, you go to school, you know, that's it. And, and, and here I was about, well, you know, a kid of, uh, what is it, ten? I was about three feet seven. And, and my kid brother was about two feet six. And, and so... <laughs> <laughs> so we put on our we put on our long black stockings, about four pairs of them. We put on two pairs of long johns. I put on four sweaters, three pairs of corduroy pants, including the one that had the twigs growing out of it. I put on my 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 woolen socks that I used in gym. I put on my tennis shoes. I put on over them my galoshes, and over them I put on another pair of woolen socks. I put on my earmuffs, my leather helmet. I put on my my sheepskin coat. I put on, I must have weighed at least 250 pounds. And for a 56 pound kid, that's a lot, you know? And, and so, at that point, I, I am propelled. I go out the front door, followed by my kid brother. Well, I, all I can say is that I burrowed all the way to more. <laughs> I literally burrowed. I'm telling you the truth. There was no question about it. All the kids are just burrowing their way like worms through gigantic walls of ice. And that's it. It's funny how people were. They, they, they never thought in terms of the kids freezing on their way to school and they forget it. We'll never see you again. They just went. And there's that brilliant sunshine out there. It's about, you know, it's about 7.30. The kids got to be to school by 8. And I am down in the snow burrowing. My kid brother is burrowing to the left and I am burrowing to the right. And all around me in the great walls of ice, I could hear other kids maybe 40 or 50 feet away burrowing. Just burrowing. You could hear ice chipping and kids sniffing and crying, but burrowing their way towards the geography class. Burrowing and chopping. Well, it must have been like 11.30 or 12 o'clock, or maybe even 1 o'clock, by the time I finally arrived at school. I got at school, and there must have been, oh, there must have been maybe 100 kids out of maybe... 700 or 800 kids that were supposed to be there. There were 100 kids would arrive, but it was not that these kids were not coming. Everyone knew they were on their way. You know, they were burrowing their way. So I'm sitting in, in the class there. Miss Smith, who was a sixth grade teacher, she says, well, I guess we might as well send you kids home. The kid's okay. They get up. 
They put on everything that they had just taken off. They go out and start burrowing home. That was all there was to it. You burrowed home. Well, as far as you could see was, was this gigantic... Storm. Everything stopped completely. The wires were down. The streetcars stopped running. Uh, the, the, the great big high-tension poles were just laying over like, like enormous old melted icicles. And we got back. It was a big deal. You know, the kids really dug it. So we got back home, and we, we climbed up on the porch. It's now about 3.30. It's getting dark. And, and that's it. That was the giant snowstorm. That snow, we did not get our car out of the garage for roughly three weeks. I'd say anywhere from three to five weeks. And don't think for one minute that the old man wasn't glad. It was the only time he could get away from that rotten Graham Page <laughs> and do it legally. And so, and by the way, it was my old man's... He used that as an excuse the following spring to get another rotten car. He says, that Graham is shot after the big snow. What am I going to do? Every big snow, he always used it as a cop-out so he could get rid of the latest turkey that he bought. I'll never forget the Hupmobile with the rubber transmission. You don't want to hear about that. But <laughs> this, this, this snow was, was there, and it, it laid there. I would say, oh, probably that snow laid on the ground and the, the concomitant disaster and confusion. That was, that was not considered a disaster, though. It was just considered a bigger storm than usual. Nobody said much about it. There was a lot, not a lot of writing about it. But that started a cycle. And if any of you are interested in history of, uh, of meteorological events in America, that is one of the longest cold cycles that ever hit the Midwest, that area. As a matter of fact, there was something like six weeks where the temperature did not rise above zero one day. And it hovered roughly in the, in the average vicinity of some 15 below all the time, 24 hours a day. And, and it got to the point where, where if the temperature got up to zero, that was like great, you know. You take off your sweaters and start running around and hitting tennis balls and stuff around. Oh, really? That's true. And all along the, the fronts of the houses were icicles that just like great sheets just lay right down all the way to the ground. Great, fat, flat sheets just laying down there just hanging down and the and the light is so beautiful the light is is, is cannot even really be described the light a, co a combined light of snow coming through icicles covering windows gives a peculiar stained glass quality to even the rottenest house and and there were these enormous icicles that hung down outside of our kitchen window and my mother is looking through the geraniums in her orange chenille bathrobe and looking at just a great big wall of icicle. And she'd keep looking, and once in a while you'd hear Bruner out there muttering on the other side of his icicles. And it was, it was like, you know, it was a big party. Everybody enjoyed the big storm. They were all there, and they stayed there, and they looked out, and they sang, and they hollered, had fist fights. By the way, the population had a tremendous zoom about eight or nine months later. But storms do many things.